प्रसार भारती अभिलेखा गार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना With a brief account of your early childhood, education, and the background in which you grew. Well, I suppose I could begin with my place of birth and my early schooling. Right. This is. I was born in Nainital, up in the hills of of the UP, in nineteen hundred and nine, quite a long time ago, and uh, I went to. A, Rather well-known school at the time, public school, mm-hmm. called P.S. College. It was at the top of the hill. In Nainital itself. In Nainital itself, we were day scholars, and I used to ride up every morning at crack of dawn, reaching the school at at eight o'clock. This went on for nine long years, rain, hail, or shine. I did fairly well in school. Well. As notoriously, I got a, a first all the time, and uh, which didn't make me very popular with my fellow pupils, although the teachers were rather gratified at the result. In fact, my brothers had all been to the same school, and uh, most of them had uh, distinguished themselves. So I, I had uh, the example to go by. Who were your brothers? Will you kindly name them? Well, my elder brother was. Uh, Mr. Bhagwat Dayal, yeah. who uh, was a barrister but, but didn't practice, he became professor at the Rabat University, and after independence, he was uh, invited to join the central government, and he was our first ambassador in in Thailand, and then in Indonesia, Afghanistan, and so on. Also, my youngest brother. Yeah. Was also in the foreign service. He was a member of the of the ICS, Indian Civil Service, like myself. But he was then uh, during British days drafted into the elite foreign and political service. Mm-hmm. Members of the service were chosen by Sir himself. What is the name of your younger brother? Harishwar Dayal. So Harishwar Dayal then served in the. Foreign and political service as a agent to the Governor General in uh, Gujarat and Karnataka states mm-hmm. and some other positions. And after independence, he well, naturally belonged to the foreign service, and he was Pandeji's first private secretary, okay. uh, dealing with the uh, foreign affairs matters. So, so now coming back to the school. So uh, we were all at, at that school. There was long tradition of dayals <laughs> in the school. In fact, my my elder brother joined in 1909, the year I was born, and my youngest brother finished in 1930. We were a long series of brothers, five brothers. One of my brothers also became the. Your teacher must all be foreigners and Britishers particularly. Well, well yes, yeah, British and some Anglo Indians. Mm-hmm. There are not too many Indian students. Very few, in fact. Even the students, there were not too many Indians. No, very few. Mm-hmm. Well, after my schooling, I got a first uh, class honours in the senior Cambridge. Then came down to Lahore and uh, joined the KP College there. Did my inter- intermediate, where I didn't do so well. Then switched over to the BA from science to arts, and uh, there I did quite well in the in the BA. Got. First class, pretty high up in the list. With the uh, first coming first in in two of the three subjects in the university. Then I M A. I was the only first class in both the previous and the final M A. Your subject in M A. I was an M A in, in history right. and B A in, uh, in economics and history and of course English. Well, as a students who were supposed to be good at their studies were expected to do those days i along with so many others took the ics examination the idea was to take it from england because there were certain advantages of fund passed out in england mm-hmm. however I, i had a a try and, and to my surprise i i got in <laughs> so that uh, 
This was in an uh, examination took place in 1931. Well, I spent two years at Oxford for my... After your selection? After the selection. In Fairy uh, Yes, as a probation on the Indian Civil Service. I thought I'd do my MA from Oxford, but I didn't uh, make up my mind to, to take the, the course. So I took the easy path and uh, just had a very pleasant and I hope a useful time at Oxford. I uh, well, happened to have been assigned to the uh, UP mm-hmm. to which I belonged, which was regarded as rather fortunate by my other fellow Indian ICS probationers because everybody wanted to go back to his home state. But I, I think I was uh, awarded my home state because I was fairly high up in the list. Right. Well, it was a great experience being in the service. So before we come to the service and how you did and all that, will you be kind enough to let us know about a little more? When were you married? Were you married before uh, you became ICS and all that? And uh, the situation and family background at that point of time? Uh, no, I wasn't married then. I married considerably later. After coming to the service? Uh, yeah, after coming to the service. In fact, we belong to a fairly, regarded as a fairly progressive community, and with the Mathur Kaistas. Right. Mm-hmm. My family comes from Agra, actually. And uh, so we're quite a well known family of Agra. And my grandfather were lawyers and, uh, and regarded as races of Agra. Right. My father decided to go up to Nainital, which had just been opened up, the Kumau area, to start his, his practice. To begin with, the idea was that one goes to a Mufasil town to start up his practice and then comes to the, to the High Court subsequently. In Agra, he already had a, had a base because his uncle was a leading lawyer. But uh, he liked Nainital so much that he raised a family there, so we went to in schools so and decided to stay on there. And, uh, but he died rather early, before his 50th year. And then my mother, who was a very remarkable person, she managed the family affairs and family property and arranged for her education and everything. I sent my elder brother to England and all, she did all that. Mm-hmm. Although she herself observed Parda as was done those days. But she didn't believe in Parda for the next generation at all. As but, far as concern your wife or your elder wife, no Parda? No question whatsoever. I mean, she was brought up in another time, another generation. Mm-hmm. when. Uh, among, among families of a, of a certain level of society, the ladies did observe Parda. Well, I married her uh, in 1938, to be exact. I joined the service in 1933. My first posting was in, in Itawa. And uh, our early training was with our, with our, with our British collectors. Yeah. The idea was that uh, in a small district where the collector was young, he would, he would also welcome the company of a, of a young officer and uh, in the process the young officer would also be uh, taken through his paces in the service, taught the work. I, mean, I must say that was a very good system. I, I lived my, with my collector as a paying guest, a man called uh, William Waters Finlay. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I uh, was very much struck by the thoroughness and conscientiousness mm-hmm. with which uh, he worked. So one learnt a lot by just watching him and being given small responsibilities to, to discharge. I was appointed a, a third class magistrate with the power to impose up to one month's uh, imprisonment and a fine of, I think, 50 rupees. My first case was a Marpeet case, and in fact, a cross case. One party accused another party of beating it up, and then the party complained against, made a complaint against the first party. And so I had to hear both cases. And all the witnesses, they were 
swore an oath that uh, the persons for whom they were deposing were absolutely innocent as to the other party that was responsible. I just couldn't make up my mind as to what judgment to pass, as to which was the guilty party. So when I, I was very anxious about this whole case. So my collector asked me what my problem was, so I told him this was it. He said, well, he said that they're both liars, so find them both to the maximum extent possible, which I did. Well, it was, it was a very useful training. When I, was, when I was under training under another young British collector, where also I stayed with him as a guest, this time in Peelibheet, an even smaller district, you see, where the collector was even younger. But he was a very capable man, Cambridge Wrangler in mathematics. And I, I was stuck here, here with the, every morning at, at half past six, we'd go for a, for a ride. And uh, this collector, Ronald Simons, knew all the uh, trees and all the names of the birds and their habits and everything. And he knew the soil. He would tell me whether the soil was Matiar or Bhur or Chiknod. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were riding a clone and he said, this is this soil and that soil. So this way one learned a great deal just uh, going along this way. Mm -hmm. Well, after some time, my next posting was in uh, Jhansi, a much bigger place. And uh, I became a first class magistrate or subdivision officer. Well, the remarkable thing about that system of administration was uh, how much uh, time we spent uh, out in the villages as a district magistrate, which I became uh, a few years later. It was compulsory to for 90 days in the cold weather, under canvas, not in dark bungalows. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no going about in jeeps. We were expected to ride. I kept a couple of horses all along. Uh, my wife also co could ride. This is all it was easy perhaps to maintain horses uh, those days. Well, we were well paid, I must say, considering the cost of living. I mean, uh, far better paid. I was in my first uh, year as a collector than I was when I was uh, the Foreign Secretary to the Government of India. And one didn't know what to do with one's, uh, with one's salary, so one could maintain a dozen servants, and very good servants are there. But uh, that apart, I mean, we, were, we didn't have any financial problems whatsoever. Uh, but we had really got to know the villagers by riding in their midst and uh, spending such a long time in, under canvas settling land disputes on the spot, mm -hmm. inspecting thanas, town areas, and so on. My wife had uh, just come back from Cambridge after taking her MA from there. And uh, she wasn't used to this kind of district life at all, but I must say she began to enjoy it. She ha happened to be the daughter of Sir J.P. Srivastava, who was a a Minister of Education in the UP and Finance subsequently and a, rather a big industrialist. Mm -hmm. Subsequently he came to the Viceroy's Executive Council and yeah. a, at the time of his death he was a member of the Raj Sabha. So uh, we uh, then spent uh, some time in Jhansi, at least I got married later when I was in Karvi, Banda. Right district. And uh, after that I became, a, we went into settlement, land settlement. So also very good training. I did the settlement of Tehsil. I so think uh, in early days, officers when they began serving, they were sent to settlement in any case, wasn't well, it? Well, not all officers. Mm -hmm. This was regarded as a trying, a difficult job. And uh, those who went into settlement were fairly well regarded in the service because it gave them a thorough grounding of, or supposed to, of uh, agricultural matters. Well, it meant uh, being on horseback uh, from uh, early morning to late in the evening and uh, seeing every single field and 
classifying the fields into uh, different categories mm -hmm. and settling a lot of disputes on the spot because all the land records were revised, mm -hmm. the entire land revenue was revised. In course of demarcation? Yes, it was the land revenue was based upon a certain formula, based upon the rental value of the land. And uh, I remember then that I, I raised the, the land revenue of the Asil Sikandra Rao by one lakh rupees, which was regarded as a very big rise at the time. This was the 40th year settlement. And in fact, the Nawab Sahib of Chatari, whom I knew, was a little annoyed because I had increased his land revenue. <laughs> it was again in the <laughs> Substantially, in Aligarh district. Yeah. To continue the chronicle, after settlement, I became a district magistrate for a while in Chansi, then in Matra, and then Barabanki, near Lucknow. I then was called to the secretariat in Lucknow as a deputy secretary in the civil supplies department. Sir, I'd like to intervene here and ask you another question. That uh, you became district <coughs> magistrate and that was the period even when you joined ICS, the nationalist struggle perhaps was on. We would like to know your account of socio-political situation in the country at that time and uh, the response of Indian civil servants particularly and with a special uh, reference to your response to that. Yes, yeah, that's a very relevant question. I must say that for the first few years of my service, uh, we didn't feel anything in the districts at all. There were the usual problems in the, of the villagers and uh, making use of forest produce and uh, little trouble there, but they were nothing very serious. I happened to be in, in Matra in 1940 when uh, this individual Satyagraha was offered. Right. And uh, Acharya Narendra Dev offered himself for arrest. And uh, in normal course, he was arrested in a very civilized way, and that was that. There was no other problem in, in uh, Matra at all at the time. When I went to Barabanki, of course, the, the, the August movement came on. No, but before all that, were you feeling any stress as an Indian in civil service, perhaps, when uh, the freedom no, struggle was going on? Not at that time. Yeah, the stress uh, began. I would say, from 1942 onwards, in Not my experience. Of course, there were troubles going on in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But in the districts where I was, it was only in, uh, in Barabanki, from which the famous Kidwai family comes. And many of those members I knew before the 42 troubles started, uh, that uh, the situation became somewhat embarrassing. Although I must say that uh, the leaders there were, were very kind, I should say. They, they didn't make things difficult for me at, at all. And uh, Jamilur Rahman Kidwai was one of the leaders there. He was arrested. But I'm glad to say that we had no lati charges and no violence of any kind, either on the part of the demonstrators or on the part of the uh, police authorities. Mm -hmm. I had a problem once uh, over the cutting of telephone wires which ran along the canal because uh, the instructions were from Lucknow that uh, collective fines should be levied wherever such incidents occurred where investigation also was impossible because nobody would uh, depose. I looked into the matter and I, I found that, that uh, it would be very unfair to impose a fine because uh, people who did that sort of thing would uh, bicycle up from Lucknow or wherever along the canal roads mm -hmm. and wires and disappear. And the villagers in my district are people that didn't even know that this was going on. Now, if I had uh, imposed a fine on them, 
then uh, it would have been very unfair and unjust. Well, I was asked for my explanation as to why I hadn't taken any action. And this was the answer I gave. I said it would have been counterproductive. Created resentment against the authorities. Till that time, they were, the villagers were trying to protect their own areas as, as much as they could. Now, I must say, to the credit of the powers that be, that were in Lucknow, uh, no, no further questions are asked. So, yeah, generalize your observation and make a statement and see to your account of that. That, on the one hand, the struggle was going on, people at last, they were participating in the struggle, and then uh, government was uh, busy in quelling their uh, struggle. Uh, did you feel any crisis of confidence existing between the Indian civil servants in relation to the people and Indian civil servants in relation to the British uh, civil servants who were managing for them? Yes, well, there was a certain uh, tension, undoubtedly, between the Indian officers and the, and the British officers. And uh, as the war situation deteriorated and the uh, independence movement intensified, the suspicion grew. And uh, I must say in all frankness, you know, the British, uh, at the head of affairs in the state, they began to favor, at least we felt they began to favor the Muslim officers, whether of the Indian civil service or of the provincial service, over the Indian in, Indian civil service officers. They never, they never spoke to us about this at all. I mean, I think they were very sensitive to our feelings. And uh, I, I can say in my case that uh, before the situation became very difficult for me personally, I was uh, recalled to Lucknow. So that saved me from getting involved in a situation which I may have found very difficult. Now, my wife and her family, her, her mother, it's a very curious situation that her mother was a, a habitual wearer of Kadi, she was a president of the All India Women's Conference, one of the foreigners of the ladies of the women's emancipation movement. She, be, she became a member, the only woman member of the UP Council and, and as vice president in the old days, I'm talking of the early 1930s. And she was a great devotee of Gandhiji, who actually stayed at their place in Kanpur and with all, with all the national leaders. My father-in-law was, was of a different persuasion, you see. He was a minister and he was a, had been knighted three times. So there was a certain feeling, a, a strong current, I should say, <laughs> in the family, political current. The daughters, there were five of them, they, they were all very much with the mother and uh, my wife included. Did all these not create crisis of confidence in the family itself? Well, my wife tried to persuade me to resign. So I said, well, that's all very well. Your father is a, is a million, mill owner, but, I'm, but I, I have to depend on my job for, for a living. I, I can't just afford to do it. But if a time comes when things become really too difficult and I'm torn between uh, my uh, sentiments and my professional obligations, then I'll have to take a very serious decision. I must say that I, I was saved from that particular choice. And not many members of my, of my service Indians uh, had to make that choice because somehow the, the British managed to move us discreetly from a, a difficult situation to something which was less troublesome from our, the point of view of our consciences and our sentiments. I think subsequently, the, the, when the national government came in, they, they appreciated the fact that they did have people who had had a thorough grounding in the business of administration. Do you remember some of your colleagues at that time? Uh, some very, very distinguished colleagues. Well, among the, among the, the senior most Muslim officer was Mr. Wajahat Hussain, mm -hmm. who became a, was a minister in the Kashmir government subsequently, member of the ICS and uh, whose son is now in the Prime Minister's Secretariat, a member of the IAS, son or grandson, if you mm. which. And... Uh, what is his name, sir? He, he's also Wajahat. Achha. Yes. And uh, there was Sadiq Hassan, also a very fine man, very patriotic. Mm. Hifazat Hussain, brother of Wajahat Hussain. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I can mention quite a few other names. Uh, Khurshid Ahmad Khan, who was a chief commissioner of Delhi yeah. at the time of independence and, and thereafter. Uh, he was a son of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan of, of uh, Aligarh, a very distinguished family. So we had people of great distinction among the Muslim officers. The Hindu officer there was Vishnu Sahai, who was very senior to me. Yeah. Uh, the Bhagwan Sahai, also senior to me. And uh, A.D. Pandit became governor's secretary to, to the governor. Very, very capable and eminent, eminent people. The British, of course, felt a felt beleaguered because the war situation was going very badly. Yeah. And uh, I must say that we reveled in their discomfiture because it sort of shook their self-confidence a bit. Yeah. But, I, but I couldn't understand their feelings that uh, the whole ground seemed to be slipping away from under their feet. But of course they tried to do the best they could according to their lights to try and salvage the situation. Some among them, uh, not in my, my service, were occasionally rather nasty. You see, a lot of people came in uh, from abroad, uh, uh, British, in connection with the war effort against uh, Burma and, and so on. Excuse me. So, sir, you were talking about some of your eminent colleagues, particularly Muslim colleagues. So, to continue the story further, we would like you to comment on uh, other people also who worked with you and whom you still remember. Yes, well, I, I had a very capable officer, Ikram ul Haq, who was with me as a joint magistrate, both in Matra and in Barabanki. Then he became a regional food commissioner during the war years. And at the time of independence, he came from Quetta, thoroughly patriotic person, but because of his home, he opted for Pakistan. Uh, some other Muslims who, I think one, of, one or two of them for ideological reasons, did go to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. The others stayed on in, in India. Who were they, sir, who stayed in India, your eminent? Well, Khushid Ahmad Khan was one. Ah, yes. I mentioned uh, Hifazat Hussain, Bujahat Hussain, Siddiq Hassan, Qureshi, among the very junior officers. Mm -hmm. When did you come in UP Secretariat? In what capacity did you work there and up to what time? Well, I came in 1942, in end of, to, and uh, came as Deputy Secretary in the Civil Supplies Department. And uh, in 19, early 1946, I became Secretary to Government. I was Home Secretary. In UP? The, the, first, the first Indian Home Secretary, in the time of the British. Will you tell us, as Home Secretary, some of the crucial things that you did or you faced? Well, that was... You were holding very sensitive posts, for particularly taking a, time into the conservation. That was indeed a very sensitive post and uh, I was there during the transition period. Yes. When the Congress government came in, the, the whole situation sort of changed dramatically. Yes. I remember the lot of tension also built up because of the elections in 46. Well, particularly UK and Bihar, if you will. There was some, but there was no, there was no serious law and order problem mm -hmm. it, that we could take care of those days. But the, the transfer of power was a very dramatic uh, experience. And uh, the, the manner in which the government house changed completely, because we always went to government house in very formal clothes. Mm -hmm black tie or sometimes tail coat and that sort of thing. And, uh, and suddenly we found that uh, at the time of independence, the gates were thrown open and people just swarmed in. Anybody came along and all, all the mitais and other things that were, had been served in the dining room they disappeared very quickly and the whole situation was, was very, very different. But I remember we, we received cards for the ceremony and uh, on one side in English, the other side in Hindi. Even then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the card in Hindi said, Dhoti pehna uchit hoga. Well, I'm not a great fancy of the dhoti myself. So, uh, all my colleagues also were in a bit of a quandary as to what to put on. I thought the best, uh, the formal dress, Indian dress, is a tang pajama and, uh, and a sherwani, which I had, which I put on. But many colleagues had to devise 
their costume, especially my South Indian colleagues mm -hmm. from, from the ICS, put on a, a, a mundu and uh, then, a, uh, then a shirt over, over the mundu, which didn't look very formal. Mm -hmm. However, this was one of the experiences that there was a complete change over. We felt a complete. Uh, Will you give us an account of uh, this transition uh, of transfer of power as you saw in UP and particularly from your position as Home Secretary? You see, the, the troubles were, were brewing in the Punjab, terrible troubles. And uh, we were very worried about our Western borders. This was before independence. Mm -hmm. I decided to go to Lahore and find out things for myself. I saw the top officials there, the chief secretary happened to be a, an ICS man, a Muslim gentleman called Akhtar Hussain. Mm -hmm. Akhtar Hussain? Yes. He uh, painted a, a pretty awful picture of what has been going on in, in uh, the Punjab, especially the Western districts. And he, I, I remember him showing me pictures of all the Sikh family, Sikh families mm -hmm. being converted and and the, the beards being sort of reshaped mm -hmm. to look like Muslim beards and that type of thing. Well, I felt alerted that look, uh, this can happen even before independence, while the British were still around, although with dwindling power and prestige. What might happen at the time of and after independence? Mind you, I was still in my middle thirties when uh, these uh, responsibilities fell to me. And uh, I remember the British governor, the last British governor, was a person, a very eminent man, Sir Francis Wiley, who sub subsequently became a director of the Suez Canal Company. Mm -hmm. And he was a very friendly person. Incidentally, I must mention here one more point about the attitudes as they prevailed within the service. See, while in, in the office or in the place of work, the British and Indian officers were on good terms, ostensibly. They called each other by their first names. I had British superiors, British subordinates. Yet, we had no social relations at all because uh, Indian officers could not become full members of the club, the services mm -hmm. club. At, at, at Chhatar Manzil. You could become honorary members without uh, voting rights and so on. And of course, we all felt it was an infra dig to, to accept a position of that kind. So, in, no Indian officer was a member of that club. And uh, while the British would invite us to their places for a cup of tea or maybe a, a drink, it was very unusual for them to invite us to dinner. Mm -hmm. We used to invite each other frequently all the time to dinner, we were Indian officers, but not a, never a single British officer. We would sometimes ask them over to, for, for a drink or a cup of tea, but nothing more. This was what a very... was particular thing about this dinner? Well, dinner means that it's a somewhat more intimate occasion, right. where you can spend a few hours together. In a drink party, the people come and go, they're standing around and, mm -hmm. and, and that's that. It's not regarded as, a, as the same social category right. <laughs> as, as dinner, dining together, breaking bread together has a special significance. I think here the, the, the UP was rather bad from this point of view. In, in some of the other provinces, I believe, the re social relations between India and British officers were more relaxed. Why this should have been the case in the UP is difficult to say unless they felt more threatened here or whatever it was. They did, they did of course, meet some of the, you know, big talukdars and that sort of thing, but that was a somewhat patronizing relationship. Mm -hmm. Because landowners were always dependent upon the administration, I mean, however big they might have been. But uh, between us, I suppose, they felt a, some sense of rivalry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we Indian officers took to, to pride in excelling the, the British in our work. I mean, i give you an example from my own personal reaction. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I, I said to myself that I must, my noting on files must be absolutely impeccable. So that uh, when, it, when the paper went to the governor, he didn't need to change a, even a single comma. And uh, whenever my noting went to the, to the governor, he did very, very frequently. I generally write on the margin, very good or excellent, without a, a single change anyway. 
And this sort of uh, feeling I think many of my colleagues also shared, and some were very good draftsmen. In my own case, I, I used to be asked to do some of the more difficult government circulars for, for drafting. Now, uh, this is a bit of an aside, but uh, as I say that while our colleagues were, were very circumspect in dealing with us, and the very senior members of the service, advisors, like uh, Dennis Ebertson, uh, Sir Frank Sloan, Sir Frank Mudi, very, very senior people. Mm -hmm. But uh, they didn't push us, push us around, I think they were sensitive to that. But some of the military people who came, and whom one encountered occasionally at railway stations and in trains, I don't know why people behave badly in trains. You know, it's almost legendary that Indians and British get on very badly in, in railway trains. I didn't have that experience myself, but my wife had a very nasty experience. She had gone to, to Kanpur to visit her parents, and her father had come down from Delhi, where he was only a member of the Vice Royal Council. And she, of course, the family is extremely well known in Kanpur. Mm -hmm. So she came to the railway station to board a first class carriage to come to Lucknow. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was getting into a carriage where there was one Englishman, a military man, sitting there with a couple of big Alsatian dogs. And he said to her, you can't enter here. He said, why not? Of course I can. He said, no, you can't. He said, well, he said, I'm coming in. He said, well, if you come in, I'll let loose my dogs on you. Achha. She said, what right have you to say that to me? Are you a gentleman or what are you? He said, no, no, don't be insolent to me. He said, then she gave him, she said, you are a blackguard and a gutter snipe. I don't talk to, to likes, of, likes of you. But this train is not going unless I get to this compartment and travel. I have a valid first class ticket. Mm -hmm. Well, the station master came, everybody came and they all begged her. They knew who she was and who her, who her parents were. And they said, no, no, please, madam, we'll put another bogey for you and we'll come. She said, no, I'm going in this carriage. The train was held up for half an hour. And uh, she got to that carriage. She, she arrived and left now. Those type of things were happening. She told me the story, but the sequel, sequel is more, even more interesting. Okay. When, when this man came to Lucknow on this train, I, I had gone there to receive my wife. She didn't mention anything to me. And where were you posted in the secretariat at that time? I was home secretary. Achha. Now, this man, strangely enough, happened to be in the department of the government of India, of which my father-in-law was then the, the minister, namely civil defense. Mm -hmm. He was a British colonel in the, in the department. When he heard that this was his daughter, he was afraid for his own prospects. So he complained to, to Sir, Sir J.P. Sivastava and said, look, your daughter behaved very badly with me. She, <laughs> she, she called me names. It's a very peculiar story. But, but anyway, on the whole, I, I would say that uh, we found so far as a uh, Disputes between Indians and Indians were concerned, whether out in the field, cases in the courts, wherever. The British officers must be said to the credit, were very fair. But as between a British officer and an Indian officer, there was always discrimination in favor of the British officer. Achy. For instance, certain districts, which are rather delectable, like, uh, like Behradun, you know, would generally be reserved for a British officer. Or the Deputy Commissioner of Lucknow would be a British officer. There were some exceptions. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but one couldn't aspire to the really nice uh, districts. Well, I found myself uh, early 1946, appointed a uh, Home Secretary. And uh, we, uh, of course, were feel that something was happening very, you know, very grave in the country, that things were going to change very much. But how fast the pace would be, we had, one had no idea. And one didn't know what the consequences so far as uh, peace and tranquility in the country were concerned would, would be 